civil service and communications. <coughs> the Honorable Ayaz Sayyid Kayyum to move this motion. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sir, Mr. Speaker, sir, pursuant to the resolution of Parliament Wednesday, 9 December 2020, I now move that the Fiji Road and Customs Service Amendment Bill 2020 be debated, vote upon, and be passed. Thank you, sir. Is there a seconder? <coughs> Mr. Speaker, sir, I bet send another motion. Honourable members, pursuant <coughs> to the resolution of Parliament, debate will be limited to one hour. I now call upon the Honourable Attorney General to speak to his motion. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sir, as uh, discussed when I did move this particular motion for this bill on, on Wednesday, it does relate to FRCS's ability to uh, transact, in particular, the collection of the loans uh, that have been disbursed now up to nearly the tune of $30 million through the concession loan assistance scheme for the micro, small, and medium enterprises. It essentially gives the FRCS specific but similar powers that it already has in relation to other areas of uh, financial transactions. This is specifically in relation to the, these loans, Mr. Speaker. So, so you need the enabling environment within the law, enabling provision within the law for FRCS to deal with this specific area of uh, funds that have been disbursed and indeed for their ability to collect it. Similarly, they have those provisions regarding, uh, for example, TELS, and various provisions in relating to, uh, for example, customs and the uh, collection of taxes, etc. And it's essentially a replication of that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sir. Honorable members, the floor is now open for debate on the motion. Honorable Thank you, Thank you Honorable uh, Mr. Speaker. So just a short contribution on. Um, regarding the loans and uh, the grants which had been provided uh, prior regarding, uh, we had mentioned uh, monitoring and evaluation of such uh, huge uh, project in terms of the amounts which are being given out. And uh, I refer in particular on uh, how these, pro these uh, particular SMEs are monitored, their performance and uh, the reporting back to the uh, ministry. It would be good if that is done and then uh, a separate report is uh, made to the House in terms of a performance of that and whether there are bad loans, etc. in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable Nikon Waikula, you have the floor. Uh, Honorable Speaker, I wish to raise a concern. I think uh, I'm not sure about the position of this side. Possibly we will let this go. but. Uh, to create a, a concern in relation to this. Uh, my feeling is that, my fear is that this will shift responsibility away from banks. And I feel rightly that the responsibility of assessing loans and collection should be left at that where it is. The other concern that I have is in relation to Section 32C which is the Ganeshi order. Uh, we all know that in relation to collection of debt, uh, you are required first to go to court to prove it. And that goes through a process. And that allows the person who owes time to appear before court and to uh, disprove whether a debt is actually paid. Uh, it is dangerous in my view, in this case, where the uh, but the CEO or a person in the, uh, who is employed by FIRCA is allowed to do what is normally done by the court. That puts, uh, uh, that, that, that is a very dangerous uh, precedent for me. I, I, I just want to raise that. Thank you. Honorable Attorney General, you have the floor to speak. In reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sir, Mr. Speaker, sir, just uh, addressing those two issues raised by Honorable Nawai Kula. Uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, I completely agree with him that uh, I assume when he said shifts the responsibilities away from the banks, what he means, I think, um, if I could think for him, what he means is that banks should be lending money to people as opposed to government lending money. 
the reality is, as we all know, that banks, commercial banks, view these areas of lending highly uh, risky. A lot of these people who we are lending money to don't have any assets. Banks actually want assets, or they want people full-time employment. They want security. So a villager who, for example, has got 10 pigs and now wants to have another 10 pigs and put up a pig shed or pigsty, etc., the bank is not going to go and use that as collateral. He's already built that pigsty on a communal land, which he does not have a lease over. So there's no security. So a lot of these people who are being lent this money cannot offer security. And commercial banks won't lend to people without security. So that's why there's a, there's a gap. And there's always been for decades in Fiji. And this is one of the reasons what we've been doing. We've been trying to push the financial institutions in that space. We are currently, as we announced in the budget, we are working uh, now, we've revived the Fiji Investment Corporation Limited. We've asked the board to look at whether we can actually set up, for want of a better word, a small, micro, small, medium enterprise bank for them, a financial lending institution that specializes only in the lending of those areas. Like, for example, Grameen Bank, etc., has done a lot of work in that area space. FDB also, of course, does require security too, because FDB raises money uh, from the public. We've been talking to a number of our international partners. Some of them are actually interested. As you know, that when we were giving out a $1,000 grant to micro enterprises, the Indian government very generously actually gave, I think, uh, from memory, about $6 million. So we were able to utilize those funds. So there are some uh, development partners that are quite keen to partner with us and hopefully we'll be able to get some traction in that space. So that's why banks aren't in this space. Garnishing orders, uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, <coughs> already exist. I've got the Tax Administration Act, the Customs Act. The powers are already given to the CEO of FRCS to impose garnishing orders. They are not given willy-nilly, though. And we have also raised issues about that in the past. It was abused. And you will see now that the board actually has some specific directions. But the reality of the matter is that a lot of people have escaped the payment. Honor Wanganika, I think, worked with FRCS in those days, and she would tell you that how people abscond from paying. Funds can disappear overnight, they can be moved from their personal account to the son or daughter's or wife's account, and you've got absolutely no ability to then get those funds back. That's why garnishing orders have been put in place. In respect of what Honorable Tui Shawao said, yes, of course, um, but he needs to understand these people who have been lent the money have one year grace period. So nobody will be lending, uh, repaying those funds because they have been given money because of the fact of COVID-19. We know that they can't immediately do the repayments. We're giving them one year leeway. And after the first year, then they start doing the repayments. And most definitely, FRCS will have its own independent report as to how much money they've been collecting and where they've been collecting from. And those reports, of course, will be made public. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sir. <coughs> Thank you. Honourable Members, the Parliament will now vote. The question is that, pursuant to resolution of Parliament on Wednesday, 9 December 2020, that the Fiji Revenue and Customs Service Amendment Bill 2020 be debated, voted upon and be passed. Does any member oppose? As no member opposes, the motion is agreed to unanimously. Secretary General. A bill for an act to amend the Fiji Revenue and Customs <coughs> Service Act 1998, Bill Number 39 of 2020, enacted by the Parliament of the Republic of Fiji. Secretary General. Consideration of bills. I now call upon the Honorable Attorney General to move his motion. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sir, Mr. Speaker, sir, pursuant to the resolution of Parliament on Wednesday, 9 December 2020, I now move that the ozone defeating substance amendment bill 2020 be debated and voted upon and be passed. Thank you, sir. Is there a seconder? Mr. Speaker, sir, I beg to stand the motion. Honorable members, I remind that the debate is limited to one hour pursuant to the resolution of Parliament. I now call upon the Honorable Attorney General 
to speak to his motion. You have the floor, sir. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sir, Mr. Speaker, sir, as highlighted on Wednesday, the Ozone Depleting Substances Act 1998 regulates the importation, exportation, sale, storage, and use of ozone depleting substances. The Act also gives effect to Fiji's obligations under the Vienna Convention for the Protection of Ozone Layer and the Montreal Protocol on substances that deplete the ozone layer, which is called the Montreal Protocol. Fiji acceded to the Vienna Convention and the Montreal Protocol in 1989. Through the Montreal Protocol, Fiji has successfully reduced the use of ozone depleting substances, or what we call ODS, over the years. The Montreal Protocol, Mr. Speaker, says not only contributed to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions of around 1.35, sorry, 135 billion tons of carbon dioxide, but it has also been a key contributor to the global fight against climate change. Since entering into force, Mr. Speaker, sir, the Montreal Protocol has been amended five times to reflect the latest findings and science in relation to the ozone layer. The most recent amendment is a Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol, which is agreed upon on 15 January 2016 and entered into force on 1 January 2019, with the exception of the changes to Article 4 of the Montreal Protocol, which entered into force on 1 Jan 2033. The Kigali Amendment, Mr. Speaker, says designed to phase down and reduce the production and consumption of hydrofluorocarbons, or HFCs, which are frequently used in refrigeration and air conditioning systems as substitutes for ODS. Although HFCs are not ODS, they are powerful greenhouse gases that have high or very high global warming potential. On June 16, 2020, Mr. Speaker, sir, in this parliament, Fiji exceeded, sorry, following the approval by parliament, Fiji exceeded to the Kigali Amendment and such Fiji is obligated to implement legislative control of the list of HFCs outlined in Annex F to the Montreal Protocol by 1 Jan 2021. As we can see from the bill itself, Mr. Speaker, sir, the Ozone Depleting uh, Substance Amendment Bill amends the Act to, amongst other things, give effect to part of Fiji's legislative obligation under the Kigali Amendment. Essentially, the bill extends the definition of controlled substance under the Act to include HFCs and amends the renamed Schedule 1 to the Act by inserting the list of HFCs mm -hmm. outlined in Annex F to the Montreal Protocol as controlled substances under the Act. The bill also amends the Act, Mr. Speaker, sir, by inserting a new Schedule 2, which lists out prohibited substances under the Act and empowers the Minister responsible for Environment, who is the Minister responsible for the administration of the Act, to make regulations to the issuance of fixed penalties and to prescribe penalties not exceeding a fine of $500,000 or imprisonment for a term not exceeding 10 years or both. This, of course, Mr. Speaker, sir, is essential for us to be able to approve so we can fulfill our commitment, international commitments. Thank you, sir. Honorable members, the floor is now open for debate on this motion. Honorable Mr. Chabu, you have the floor. Honorable uh, Speaker, sir, this side of the house, we don't have any issue in regards to the uh, this particular bill, given it's just the, uh, our obligation to the uh, Montreal Protocol and also the Kikali Amendment, and also part of the domestication of uh, our acceding to the bill earlier this year in Parliament as a Parliament has approved, and all the various domestications and measures that are taking place, uh, and the various benefits that will come with it, that will benefit other climate uh, mitigation and adaptation uh, measures that uh, we are currently. Uh, uh, seeking in our body. Thank you. I call upon the Honorable Attorney General to speak in reply. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. Mr. Speaker, sir, I have no further comments. Thank you. Honorable Members, the Parliament will now vote. The question is, Pursuant to resolution of Parliament on Wednesday, 9 December 2020, that the ozone depleting substances amendment bill 2020 be debated, voted upon, and be passed.
Does any Secretary General? Consideration of bills. I now call upon the Honorable Attorney General to move his motion. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sir, Mr. Speaker, sir, pursuant to the resolution of Parliament of Wednesday, 9 December 2020, I now move that the telecommunication amendment, amendment number two bill 2020 be debated, voted upon, and be passed. Thank you, sir. Is there a seconder? Mr. Speaker, sir, I beg to send a motion. Honorable members, the debate is limited to one hour, pursuant to the resolution of Parliament. I now call on the Honorable Attorney General to speak on his motion. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. Mr. Speaker, sir, we had in fact uh, discussed a number of issues uh, when we had actually introduced this particular bill in the motion on Wednesday. Um, but I'd just like to very quickly essentially just summarize, Mr. Speaker, sir. Uh, the amendments seek to um, remove the archaic and bureaucratic uh, consultation process, uh, which will not only save us cost, but also expedite connectivity access. At this point in time, we are very mindful of the fact that uh, uh, we, uh, we want, get, want to get people connected, and there are people who are actually falling off uh, because they don't have access to that type of technology which bulk of Fijians are actually using. Whether it's a, a fisherman who's caught fish in the morning and wants to know whether he, where he should sell his fish, where will he get the best price from, people getting access to information, access to news, etc. You know, we have some ridiculous situations. I mean, I think Honorable uh, uh, Leader of Opposition, uh, you know, we talked about Tavuni, and we have a situation in Tavuni because, you know, we want, uh, we want actually infrastructure sharing. So we had highlighted in uh, Nokombo Levu up, up here on the hill, we've got all these different towers in, in Tavuni uh, where they have one small hill, the both of them are sharing. And because it's such a small patch on the hill, the towers actually have been tilted in such a manner just to allow them to be able to have the two towers there, but it does not give everybody coverage. So if we had one tower positioned in the right place and everybody's transmitters on it, the entire Tavuni would probably get connected. So this is one of the issues that we're trying to get over, and I think it's been quite, uh, uh, even if I say so myself, a momentous uh, achievement that we've had without any regulatory imposition. The, the service providers have actually agreed now to do uh, what we call uh, co-location. So co-location will be hugely beneficial to everybody. And we can, in time to come, obviously get all the other ones that have not been co-located to be co-located. And in that way, the entire country you know, gets rid of the unnecessary capital overhead costs, improves the operational costs also. At the moment, on one site, you may have five generators running. In this way, you need only one generator. And you can then, of course, if your towers are smaller and there are lesser towers, you, you can have, be more readily dependent on renewable energy sources too. So essentially, this is what the amendment seeks to do, Mr. Speaker, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable members, the floor is now open for debate on the motion. Mr. Speaker, sir. Honorable Monganika, you have the floor. Thank you. Well, sir, I appreciate the uh, reasoning given by the Honorable Attorney General, sir. There are concerns on this bill. Number one, when you have too many masks, in fact, all the masks in one tower, because I speak from, my, from experience at Fiji TV where I used to make submissions to the TEF. Any natural disaster, when you put all your eggs in one basket, and that tower goes down, the whole of Fiji goes down because we put all our eggs in one basket. So please consider that because you put in all, all, all the must in, in, in one tower. Number two, you have Digicel and then you have Vodafone. They have separate, um, they have separate signals. So you need to ensure that there's a, a filter. It needs to be properly filtered. Otherwise, there's a lot of interference. I'm not sure how they're going to, how they're going to work that up. How, how they're going to work that out. But I, I'm aware that some time back that there was, it was mooted to have a standards committee that prior to any move or any uh, movement to own, any, any installation of any tower, all the telcos come together, including the regulator, to discuss, to ensure that all engineering, uh, uh, all engineering aspects are covered before something goes up. Because communication is very important, and, and I totally agree with what the Honorable uh, AG said. Our people need to be connected but you need to do it properly. Now, the other issue is, 
But what happens to the current towers that are, that are all over Fiji? There's, there's roughly about 1,000 towers. A lot of this, uh, you know, you've got Digicel, you've got uh, FBC, you've got TFL. TFL is the biggest. Uh, they, have, they have the most towers around Fiji, including uh, you've got TFL as well. What happens to their investment on those towers? Who will take responsibility of those towers? Who's going to meet the cost of the new towers? We are in a situation right now, we don't know how long this global pandemic will last. I appreciate what they're bringing in, but we need to prioritize. We need to prioritize who's going to be footing the bill of the installation of these new towers. Because any cost that goes up there, the end users are the taxpayers. Let the private sector foot that. Now the other issue is, I, he's, uh, the Honorable Attorney General has mentioned about the archaic, the archaic uh, bureaucratic uh, uh, legislation where consult consulting with the landowners, it's, uh, perhaps uh, my words, is a challenge. Well, I can assure the House this, you go and put a tower without the consultation of the landowners, in my experience, and Honorable Attorney General was fully aware because we did the discussions in the Lake Oro, they will shut you down. We don't have security guards 24-7 many of those towers. They will break through them, they will siphon the fuel, they will steal the generator. That's why they need to secure those towers. You need to work with them. Take into account SEED 2012. Engage with the landowners. We are all landowners here. I am a landowner. My clan owns the second largest land in Kandavu. God forbid that government or any government for that fact goes and plants a tower without consulting my people. Oh. We need to respect each other. We need to respect each other, sir. Please consult. Whether it's the landowners, where, whoever, consult. Okay? Now the other issue, sir. We are effectively killing free and competitive enterprise. Government's, government's stance is to regulate. Let the private sector run. Now, I've also seen in the bill, you either have the universal service tower where everybody puts their mask, the other one, this is how to get communication out. The other one is to, I believe, the deployment of appropriate alternative technology other than constructing a universal service tower. I stand corrected. Sky Pacific, classic example. You had local content on Sky Pacific at the cost, not of government, of a private sector, that was 100% covered. Done by SBT, SDL, not this government. <laughs> government got money, dividends, and that was good. Tax, tax money. You can do that again. A man that media ownership clause that you put, let the cost go back. We are, we are now in a situation where we cannot be spending money nearly and willy. Speak, look at your media ownership decree, amend that. Let the local content go back on that service platform at no cost, no cost to the government. And let the content go out as far as Rutuma. That's digital platform. The world has gone digital, they still talk to us. There's not many, uh, you know, there's not many broadcast engineers, I mean, apart from Richard Lucas, you have Nitendo Prasad, Chief Nath, and I believe my good friend, um, I'm not sure whether he's still with uh, Wallace, Mike Delano Mati, but these are good people, these are experienced people, engage them. To build, back in 2007, I was told, back in 2007 at Fiji TV, back then they said, Tanya, 10, 10 years ago, to put one of these towers up, it was about 150,000. This is, this is 2020. What is our priority? What is our priority? I understand about the communication. In fact, I'll be honest, I really, really watch TV. Everything I want to watch on news, we all know it. We want to watch things real time, real time. It's all on the mobile phone. So all I ask is, please look at it carefully. Take into account what is raised in this house. And also be mindful of your priorities. Not valid. Thank you. Honorable Attorney General, do you have the floor? Um, th thank, you, you Mr. Speaker, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
I'm not sure whether Honorable Manganika was here when I presented the, 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 the bill on, on Wednesday, uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, but uh, I'm sure if she was, uh, but if she wasn't, I can tell her again, that this essentially is to do with connectivity in those areas that are not connected currently and where the mobile phone companies don't want to go because there's maybe 20 people in a village or five people living in one area or there's only a health center. This is what this bill essentially is about. And um, the, the funds actually, uh, because you came from television, you may not necessarily know about this, the funds actually are from mobile phone companies where they give a certain percentage of their gross revenue to the Telecommunication Authority of Fiji, which establishes what we call the Universal Service Funds. And then those funds are to be applied to give universal services to those people who are not connected. Now, so the co-location is about going into new areas. What the this bill does is the current access to a particular area, say in, in Lao, that is not connected, and there's maybe only 30 people living there, the current provision says you must ask the mobile phone companies to put in a tender. They're not going to do it. So they're not going to put in a tender because it's not worth their money. As you said in, the, in your days in 2007, it cost $150,000. We now are building towers that are Category 5 certified they'll cost about half a million dollars. So you can imagine that nobody's going to go there, so therefore those, that particular location in Lao won't get connected. So what this law does is saying, you don't need a tender. We've already worked with the ADBs and the World Banks and the ITUs of the world to identify, we have a project manager that is identifying specifically which areas in Fiji actually are to agree to co-locate so they're not competing with each other on a small little hill. They actually will be funded through the universal service funds. They'll provide some funding. The cost, the capital cost for them is defrayed. When your capital cost is defrayed, it means that you don't pass on your capital cost to your customer. No business will ever expend money in capital cost and not pass it on to the customer. So if their capital input is little or minimal or nothing at all, then the rates they will give to the customer will be far more attractive. We have one of the cheapest internet rates in the Pacific, even compared to Australia and New Zealand. So we want to continue down that path. That's what this bill is about. In respect of interferences, again, uh, Honorable Wanganika may not be aware of this, but we had an open tender bidding process at Suvavu House a few years back, again assisted by ITU, where every hour the tender pricing was put up on the glass door outside Suvavu House. And that was to deal with all the frequencies. And before we actually tendered out those frequencies, we had ITU to come and assist. Similarly, some of you may remember at that point in time, the frequencies on radios had also changed. Because now the, uh, the AM, the, in particular the FM, if you drive along, say from Suva to Singatoka or Nandi or Lotoka, there's a slight adjustment. And you will find, unlike before, there are no interferences. Because that's how the frequencies actually have been allocated. So there is no fear of, uh, of frequency interference. Um, the consultations in this particular act refers to the consultations in respect of identifying places that don't have mobile phone connectivity. Please understand that. Identifying areas where you don't have mobile phone connectivity. So it's like you have to have this exercise. We go out, let's go to Tavuni and let's have a big meeting and say, how many of you don't have mobile phone connections? That's the consultation. It's a waste of money. Because in those days when the law was drafted, they did not have the capacity within the Ministry of Communications nor did they have the expertise and the connectivity with people outside Fiji to be able to ascertain that. We now have people actually, one or two people going out individually in the field, finding out exactly. So I'm sure if we go to Tavuni, Honorable Lalambalavu is going to 
say, yes, please get me mobile phone connected. I go to parts of Kandahu, they say, yes, we want mobile phone connected. That's what it's all about. It's not to do with the landowners. Maybe Fiji TV went and put up towers without consulting. We don't do that. We actually do things legally. If there's a landowning unit and we re want to put up the tower there, we go through TLTB, we lease the land. We pay the market rate. That's how you put up a tower. We don't really legally put up anything. So uh, it's uh, quite a superfluous actually, observation on the part of the, of the member. It is not killing competition. In fact, it is enhancing competition. Because these are to do with the areas where there's no connectivity. So people will go if we have facilitation through USO. What will happen to all those towers already put up? All the towers that are already put up are in what we call cherry-picked areas. Most companies will go in where there's large pockets of people. Right? So they love to be in Suva Nasori Corridor. There's a tower up in Princess Road. There's a tower up in Flagstaff. There's a tower everywhere else. In such a short area. Why? Because there's lots of customers. They're not going to do up in the hills in Navosa or along the coast in the, you know, from Suva to... Uh, you know, along the Queen's Road, you go to certain places, you still have blackouts. Because there's only a few people living there. So I put on a tower there, maybe five kilometers, ten kilometers down the road, they put another tower. But if there are lots of people living along the corridor, you see a lot of towers popping up. That's what you call cherry picking. So at this point in time, this law has got nothing to do with the towers that are already up. They're there. We'll deal with them later. But we're now developing a culture of co-location. Some countries, Mr. Speaker, sir, the law has forced the telecom companies to set up what we call a multi-company company. company. Right? So all the companies have to have shares and they have one company that will own all the infrastructure. And they all contribute towards that and it's shared costs. We have not done that. At this point in time, we've done through by way of negotiation that everybody agreed to that. So that's essentially uh, what it's all about. Lastly, of course, the towers, as I mentioned, we want to build it up to Category 5 capacity because, yes, you are right, when cyclones come, a lot of things get blown down. That's one of the reasons why we actually put all the cables underground at Nandi Airport to Namaka and all of that because, nothing, because everything's underground, nothing gets blown away. But, of course, unfortunately for towers, we have to be able to put it up and we want to build it up to Category 5 standards. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. Thank you. Honourable Members, the Parliament will now vote. The question is that pursuant to the resolution of Parliament on Wednesday, 9th December 2020, that the Telecommunications Amendment No. 2, Bill 2020, be debated, voted upon and be passed. Does any member oppose the motion? As no member opposes, the motion is agreed to unanimously. Secretary General. A bill for an act to amend the telecommunications.